Good morning. Good Saturday morning. This is Kent Blaylock with SDG Bible Study. That's the Soli Deo Gloria Bible Study coming to you on this fir first month, seventh day, 2023, January 7th, 2023. And we are going to continue in our reading of the Jesus story. It's a blending of the four Gospels. And we're going to get right into it this morning. So let's begin reading. Then some of the learned lawyers and Pharisees replied, Teacher, we want to see you do a miracle. In answer, Jesus said, A generation that, that delights in evil and adultery seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Just as Jonah himself was in the stomach of the huge fish for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the depths of the earth three days and three nights. The men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. Yet someone greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of, of Solomon. Yet someone greater than Solomon is here. When the demon leaves a person, it passes through desolate areas seeking a place to rest. Not finding one, it says, I'll return to the house from which I came. When it does, it finds the place empty, swept clean, and put in order. Then it departs together seven other demons more wicked than itself, and they take up residence there. So the last condition of that person becomes worse than the first. This is the way it will be with this wicked generation. While he was still speaking to the people and a crowd was seated around him, his mother and brothers arrived. They stood outside and asked to speak with him but were unable to reach him because of the crowd. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside and want to speak with you. Who is my mother? He answered, and who are my brothers? He looked about at those sitting around him, extending his hand toward his disciples. He said, look at my mother and my brothers. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my brother and sister and mother. Again that day, Jesus began to teach. He went out of the house and sat down beside the sea. Large crowds gathered around, so he boarded a boat and sat in it. While the crowd stood nearby on the shore, he used parables to teach them many things. Listen, he said. A farmer went out to sow a seed. Some seed fell on the pathway where it was trampled, and the birds swooped down and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky places where there was, no, where there was little soil quickly sprouted up, but because it had no root and lacked moisture, it withered away as soon as the sun rose to scorch it. Other seed fell into a thorn patch where the thorns choked out any growth, but some seed fell into good soil and produced a crop 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as was sown. Then Jesus called out, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. When Jesus was at last alone, the twelve disciples along with some others came and asked him, Why are you speaking in parables to them, and what does this parable mean? He answered, You have been given the privilege of knowing the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, or of God. But others have not been so privileged. That is why I speak to them in parables, so that though they see, they may not understand, and though they hear, they will not comprehend. Otherwise, they may, they may turn and be forgiven. The prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled in them. You will indeed hear, but will not comprehend, and you will indeed see, but not understand at all. For the heart of this people has hardened, and their ears are full of wax, and their eyes are shut tight. Otherwise, they might see with their 
eyes and hear with their ears and understand in their heart and be turned back so that I might heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous men long to see the things you're seeing, yet did not see them, and to hear the things you're hearing, yet did not hear them. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand the parable? If not, how will you understand any of the parables? Understand, then, what the parable of the farmer means. The seed is the word of God. The farmer is sowing the word. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and doesn't understand it, then Satan, the evil one, comes immediately to snatch away what is sown in the person's heart, so he cannot believe and be saved. This is the person who receives seed on the pathway. In a similar way, the one who receives seed on the rocky places is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with delight. But because he isn't well rooted, he continues in his faith only a little while. When hardships or persecution come his way because of the word, immediately he stumbles and falls away. The person who receives seed among the thorns is the one who hears the word and goes his way. But the worries of this world, the pleasures of life, the seductiveness of wealth, and the passionate desires for material things creep in and choke out the word, making it unfruitful. No fruit ever ripens. The person who receives seed on the good soil is the one who hears the word with an honest and good heart. He welcomes and understands it and grips it tightly and patiently bears much fruit, 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as was sown. Then he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field, but while he slept, an enemy came and planted counterfeit wheat along with the true wheat, then left. When the good wheat began to grow and produce herd heads of grain, the false wheat grew as well. So the farmer's servant said to him, Sir, didn't you plant good seed in your field? So where did the false wheat come from? An enemy did this, he replied. Would you like us to gather it up? The servants asked. No, the farmer answered, because you might uproot the true wheat along with the false. Let them grow together until harvest time. Then I will tell the workers, first collect the false wheat and wrap them in bundles to be burned, but harvest the good wheat and store it in my barn. Do you take a lamp, as Jesus asked them, and put it under a bowl or a bed? Of course not. No one lights a lamp and then covers it or puts it under a bed. Instead, he puts it on a lampstand so people can see where they, they're going. Nothing is covered that won't be uncovered. Nothing is hidden that won't be bathed in light. Wherever, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. He also said to them, be careful how you listen. Pay attention to what you hear. The same measure you use will be used for you and even more. Whoever, whoever has will be given more and he will have an abundance. But anyone who doesn't have will lose even what he has or whatever he thinks he has. The kingdom of God is like a farmer who plants his seed, Jesus said. Then the farmer goes to sleep and wakes up day after day. His seed sprouts and grows even though he doesn't understand how. All by itself the soil yields a crop, first the shoot, then the ear, then the full head of grain. When the crop is ready, he immediately goes out to harvest it because the time is right. He also told them another parable. What is the kingdom of God like? What can we compare it? The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man planted in his garden. Though, it's among the smaller seeds, when it's planted, it grows up and becomes a large garden plant. In fact, it becomes a tree and sprouts large branches that allow birds to come and roost there and in its shade. Then he gave them another comparison. To what can I liken the kingdom of God? The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman poured into 
three batches of flour until it spread throughout the dough. Jesus used parable, parables to say all these things to the crowd. With many similar parables, he repeated the message so they could understand it. He used nothing but parables to speak to them, to fill the words of the prophet. I will speak in parables. I will, I will reveal things kept secret since the creation of the world. In private, however, he explained everything to his disciples. Then Jesus dismissed the crowds and entered the house where his disciples asked him, please explain to us what the parable of the false wheat means. He answered, the farmer who planted the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The false wheat stands for the sons of the wicked one and the enemy who planted them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the harvesters are the angels. Just as the false wheat was collected and burned, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they'll gather up everything in his kingdom that causes people to sin, and everyone who does evil. And they'll throw them into the furnace. In that awful place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then at last God's people will shine as brightly as the sun in their Father's kingdom. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. Once again, the kingdom of heaven, heaven is like treasure buried in a field, which a man found and then hid again. In his joy, he sells everything he has and buys that field. And again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, when he found one pearl of extremely high value, he sold, he sold all he owned and bought it. Or yet again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet thrown into the sea, where it caught all kinds of fish. When it was filled and hauled up on shore, workers sat down and sorted all the good fish into baskets. The bad fish they threw away. This is what it will be like at the end of this age. The angels will go out and remove the wicked from the godly and throw them into the furnace. In that awful place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus asked them, have you understood what I've been saying? Yes, Lord, they answered. Then he told them, every teacher trained for the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a fine house who brings both new and old things out of his treasure. That evening, when Jesus saw a large crowd surrounding him, he ordered his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So his disciples left the crowd and followed him into the boat, taking him just as he was. Then they sailed off, accompanied by several other small vessels. As they sailed, behold, a violent windstorm swept down on the lake. Waves began breaking over the boat, swamping it and placing them in grave danger. Jesus himself was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. His disciples woke him. They were crying out, Master, Master, we're about to die. Lord, save us. Teacher, don't you care if we die? Why are you so afraid, he said to them, you who have so little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the raging water, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. The storm died away, and an intense calm replaced it. Where is your faith? Jesus said to the disciples. How is it that you have no faith? The men were astonished and filled with overwhelming awe. What kind of man is he? They said to each other. Who is this that even wind and sea obey his command? They continued selling down to the country of the Gerasenes across from Galilee. Immediately after stepping on shore, Jesus was met by two demonized, demonized men from the city. They had just come from the tombs and were so fierce that no one dared to, to travel anywhere near them. One of the men who had been demonized a long time and wore no clothes. He lived in the tombs instead of a house. When he saw Jesus in the distance, he cried out, ran to him, and fell down and worshipped him. He shouted, What do you intend to do to us, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? 
Did you come here to torture us before the set time? In God's name, I beg you, don't torture me. This was happening because Jesus had begun to order the demon to come out of the man. For he said to him, come out of the man, unclean spirit. The demon had seized him many times and no one was able to hold him, not even with chains. He had often been restrained with shackles and chains, but he tore apart the chains and broke the shackles in pieces. And no one was able to overpower him. The demon drove him into the desert, and night and day he walked around the mountains and among the tombs, shouting and cutting himself with stones. Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he answered, because there are many of us here. Many demons had possessed him. He began begging Jesus not to order them away from there and into the pit. Some distance away on the mountainside, a large herd of pigs was feeding. All the demons begged him, If you cast us out, let us enter the herds of pigs. Go, Jesus said at once, giving them permission. The demons came out of the man and entered the herds of pigs. The whole herd, about 2,000, stampeded down the steep slope and drowned in the lake. The men who fed the pigs ran away when they saw what happened. They went into the city and the surrounding countryside and reported everything including the part about the demoniac. Then the whole city came out to meet Jesus and to see for themselves what had happened. When they met Jesus, they also found the man who had been demonized sitting at Jesus' feet. He was clothed and completely sane. The same one who had been pressured, I mean, excuse me, the same one who had been possessed by the legion, and they were frightened. The men who had seen it happen told them how the demoniac had been cured and about the pigs. Then the people from the Gerasene area asked Jesus to leave, for they were overcome with great fear. So he left. As Jesus boarded the boat, the man who had been possessed began to beg that he might be allowed to join him. But Jesus would not let him. He sent him away and told him, Go home to your relatives and tell them what great things the Lord God has done for you and how he had mercy on you. So the man left and began to report throughout the city and the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. When Jesus crossed the sea and returned to his own town, the people welcomed him, for they had been eagerly, eagerly awaiting him. While he was speaking to them, a sizable crowd gathered around him by the shore. A man named Jairus, a synagogue official, came and fell down before Jesus, worshiping him. He begged Jesus to come to his home because his only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. My little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her, he pleaded, so she'll be healed and lived. Jesus and his disciples got up and left with him, surrounded by a large crowd. Then a woman who had suffered for 12 years from a hemorrhage heard about Jesus and came up in the throng behind him. This woman had suffered a great deal at the hands of the doctors, yet none of them could cure her. She had spent all she had and still was no better. In fact, she had only become worse. She touched the hem of Jesus' robe because she told herself, If only I can touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And instantly the bleeding stopped, and she could feel that she had been cured. At that same moment, Jesus sensed that power had gone out from him. He turned around and said, Who was touching me? Who touched my clothing? Everyone denied it. Peter and the disciples who were with him said, Master, you can see this huge crowd surrounding you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? I know someone touched me, Jesus answered, because I sensed power leaving Leaving me, he began looking at the crowd to see who had done this. When the woman realized what had happened to her, to her and saw that she couldn't hide, she came to Jesus, frightened and trembling. She fell down before him and told him all the truth. She explained in front of everyone why she had touched him and how she was instantly healed. Jesus said to her, Take heart, daughter. 
Your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be free from this affliction. While he was still speaking, someone from the synagogue's leader's home arrived and said to the man, Your daughter has died. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Jesus heard these remark, remarks and said to the synagogue leader, Don't be afraid. Just believe. She will be restored to health. He allowed no one to go on with him except Peter plus James and his brother John and the gar girl's father and mother. When Jesus reached the house, he saw the flute players in the crowd making a commotion. They were weeping and wailing and mourning for her. He entered the house and told them, Please leave. Why are you making such noise and weeping so? Don't weep, for the girl didn't die, but is only sleeping. They knew, however, that she was dead, and they laughed at him. When he had put them all out, he took the girl's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where, she, where the child was laying. He took her by the hand and said, Talithi kumi, which means, young girl, get up. Immediately her spirit returned to her body, and she got up and walked. Then he ordered that she be given something to eat. Everyone was astonished. Jesus warned them all not to tell others what had happened. Nevertheless, reports about it circulated all over the area. And that's going to conclude our reading from God's Word this morning as it is compiled in the Jesus story. Some amazing things going on today. We have a young girl raised from the dead. We have a woman with an issue of blood uh, that was healed by merely touching Jesus' robe. Uh, we had the teaching uh, of parables of the good soul. And we had the demoniacs healed, demons cast out into a herd of pigs. Jesus is truly God, truly amazing. What a great God. What a great Savior. Very busy day today in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Hope you enjoyed the reading this morning. I hope you will return with me tomorrow as we'll be into day eight of our reading. And I hope you're preparing even now to be in a place of worship tomorrow, worshiping our great God. Have a blessed day today. Soli Deo Gloria.